Okay, so we will start with chapter 1, Introduction to Matter and Measurements. So, chemistry is the science of studying matter, its properties and its behavior. When we usually say matter and its properties, um, is, as this picture shows, we, would, we are all aware of the three different states of matter, which we usually see everything in either solid state or as a liquid state or as a vapor state. Those are the three common states of matter we usually see. And this is water existing in three different states, water vapor and um, liquid water and ice. Um, so what do we mean by matter? Matter is defined as anything that can occupy space and which has mass. One common mistake we make is differentiate, cannot, we cannot differentiate between matter and energy. Light and heat, for example, are they matter or energy forms? They are just energy forms, light energy, heat energy. They do not have any mass. They do not occupy space. Okay? So, light and heat, for example, are forms of energy, not matter. Matter should have mass and it should occupy space. Those are the two conditions in order for something to be matter. Now, here is a picturization of different forms of matter. Um, so, the first two boxes, uh, note that they contain only one kind of atoms. So, each of those sphere, colored sphere you see, we can call them atoms. And atoms are the smallest building blocks of matter, which would retain the chemical properties. So, the first picture shows just atoms of an element. If you take a pure element, let us say copper, um, those are copper atoms. Now, the second picture shows two spheres join together, right? So, when two or more atoms join together, we call it a molecule. They are not atoms anymore. They are called molecules. And the second picture is also from a single element because both spheres are of the same color. That means they are from the same element. Now, the last two boxes, if you look at them, it is not all made of same color balls, right? So, we see the number C, molecules of a compound. So, there is a new word, compound. What is a compound? A compound should contain two or more atoms of two or more element or different elements. Um, and the last picture is mixture of elements and a compound. So, as you can see in the last picture, we have everything we have seen so far. We put everything we have seen so far, so it makes it a mixture. We have atoms alone, we have molecules of a pure element, and then we have that compound which we have seen. So, it is a mixture of everything. So, once again, atoms are the building blocks of matter. They are the smallest particle which retains its chemical properties. And each element is made of same kind of atoms or if you take an element, say for example gold, it does not matter from where you take the atom, it is all going to be the same, it all has the same chemical properties. And as I said a compound has to be made of two different, two or more different kinds of elements that combine in a definite proportion, that is important in a chemical compound that proportion, how different elements combine together, that proportion is always fixed. Say for example, water. We all know the formula of water is H2O. What does that tell us about the chemical composition? Two hydrogens per one oxygen. 
and for water regardless of you take water from United States or Australia or China does not matter, it is always going to be H2O. If hydrogen and oxygen combine in a different ratio then it is not water. In order to be water it has to have that definite proportion, that is what you mean by um, elements are combined in a definite proportion. Now once again the states of matter, we know the three common states, gas, liquid and solid. Uh, we will look into little more uh, the properties of each of those states. So when we say gas, there is a total disorder. The atoms or molecules, they can just move around in any way they want. There is no order of arrangement. And particles have freedom of motion. They just um, move around um, in whatever space available to them. Whereas liquid, there is some disorder and particles or clusters of particles are free to move. We know that liquid particles will move, uh, but compared to gases, they stay more close together. Whereas in solids, as you can see, there is an ordered arrangement. The atoms or particles are essentially have fixed positions. They do not have the freedom of movement. Um, and again, Gases can be compressed, we know that, right? When we put air into the bicycle tire, we are compressing air and putting it in. So gases can be compressed to a great deal, liquids to some amount, not to a great deal but some amount, solid cannot be compressed because they already have that ordered arrangement and they occupy with all possible, um, they occupy all the possible space and if you compress them anymore, nothing happens because they cannot go any, anywhere else. Um, this is just the general um, properties of these three um, states. So we are going to classify matter um, in this tree diagram, so matter as we said anything that can occupy space and something which has mass and now we are going to see whether it is uniform throughout. What do we mean by uniform? The same. the same. So if it is the same throughout, then we can say it is homogeneous. So the word homogeneous means something which has uniform composition. But if it does not have uniform composition, then we call it heterogeneous or heterogeneous mixture. Um, once you have something homogeneous, then you are going to see does it have a variable composition. Well, let us take an example and work it through. So let us say we have um, a glass of salt water, okay. You take a glass of water and you put, it, put a teaspoon of salt and it is dissolved. Once the salt is completely dissolved, if you look at water, what is its composition? How does it look like? Is it same? It is cloudy, that is because salt is dissolved. My question is, can you see any variation of salt concentration in any part of the glass? No, it looks the same. It does not matter you choose a spoon of salt water from the top or from the bottom. It is it's just the salt water once it is dissolved completely. If it is not dissolved completely, then it is a different matter, but we are talking about after the salt is been completely dissolved. That we can call it a homogeneous mixture or homogeneous solution. Now what if the salt is not dissolved completely? Some of it is, um, you can see visibly some of the particles in the bottom of the glass. Then it becomes heterogeneous because the composition is not the same, okay. That is what the difference between homogeneous and heterogeneous. Now, does it have variable composition? Even homogeneous substances can have variable composition. Um, that composition means chemical composition. So salt water can have variable composition based on how much salt you put in. That is, if I put only one teaspoon of salt, that chemical composition or that uh, composition of salt and water is variant from a glass of water with 10 teaspoons of salt, right? 
so that composition can be varied and if it can be varied then we would say it is a solution homogeneous mixture but if the chemical composition does not vary then we call it a pure substance and pure substances can further be divided into elements and compounds. So, if a pure substances cannot separate into further smaller substances then it is an element but if it can be separated into further simpler substances then it is a compound. So, this is how we classify matter. Now, we will look into the properties and changes of matter a little more in detail. So, a couple of definitions, um, physical properties. So, when we say physical property of something that means that property can be observed without changing a substance into another substance. Say for example, boiling point, water, you boil water, you can observe the boiling point of water 100 degrees Celsius water is, the liquid water is converted into water vapor, but is the chemical composition changing? It is still H2O, right? It is just say state, it just changes its physical state, but it does not change the composition. So, boiling point and density, mass, volume, those things, those are called physical properties. Whereas, chemical properties can be observed when a substance is changed into another substance. Say for example, flammability. Uh, if you burn gasoline, natural gas, they are getting converted into something else, mostly carbon dioxide and water. So, something is converted into new substances. So, that is its chemical property. Corrosiveness, when we say metals, mainly iron, we say it rusts, right? So, shiny iron nail, if you leave it outside, you know, in a moisture atmosphere for some time, you can see a brown layer of rust forming on it. That is a chemical change. Rust is not just iron, it is iron oxide. So, it is a different substance. So, such properties are called chemical properties. And another way of um, defining properties, intensive and extensive properties. Intensive properties are independent of the amount of the substance you have. Once again, observing boiling point of water. Does it matter you are boiling one glass of water or one liter of water? The boiling point is going to be the same, right? So, that is intensive property. But whereas extensive property depends upon the amount of matter. Again, mass of one glass of water and one gallon of water is going to be different because it depends upon what is the amount you have. Similarly, volume, again, one glass versus one gallon depends upon the quantity you have. So, those are extensive properties. Now, physical change those are changes in matter that do not change the chemical composition. As I just said, um, boiling point of water when you are observing, liquid water is converted into water vapor. Still, water, water. You are not changing the chemical composition, whereas chemical change will result in the formation of a new substance. Once again, combustion reactions. Um, the best example is you burn gasoline in your car. So, what happens to the gasoline? It is getting converted into carbon dioxide, water and lot of heat. It produces lot of heat and that is the heat you use to run the car. So, chemical change versus physical change. Chemical change, you get a new substance with new chemical composition. Physical change, it is just states, liquid to vapor to gas, something like that. The substance chemical identity is still the same. Guys, during the lecture, any time you have to ask me a question, raise your hand and stop me and ask a question. Do not wait for me to ask, do you have any questions, okay? So, chemical reactions, when we say a chemical reaction, what do we mean by that? A chemical reaction two or more pure substances will 
do something and produce something else entirely different like formation of water. You have hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, two gases with entirely different chemical properties. They combine together, it is a burn reaction. Um, it produces a lot of heat also when these two gases combine together and makes water which has again entirely different chemical properties. Um, again this first chapter guys, it is just kind of a review of terms and uh, you know basic definitions which we will be using further in our semester. Now separation of mixtures, so as we said mixture has two or more compounds in it and there are a couple of methods we use, um, there are a lot of methods but couple of methods we will just focus on. Uh, one method is called filtration. So this method is used when you have a mixture of a solid and a liquid. So you make a, you know you have filter papers based on uh, what is the solid size and you just make a, you know corn out of the filter paper and pour your uh, mixture into it, the liquid will pass through and collected in that other beaker, the solid will remain in the filter paper, very simple. And you will be doing this a lot in the lab. Now when you have a homogeneous mixture like salt completely dissolved in water, if you want to separate that into its components that is salt alone and pure water, this process is called distillation. Now what happens in distillation? Distillation uses the differences in boiling points. So say for example you have salt water here, this flask contains salt water and your goal is to collect pure water separate from the salt. So you boil this and the water is going to boil, right? Once the water boils, the vapor will be collected through this long pipe which is kept cool by running cold water outside and the vapor when it hits the cold surface it condenses back to water and you collect that pure water in the receiving flask. So and if you keep boiling after all the water is boiled off, what is left in this flask? Salt. So now you have two things separated. So that is distillation, it is not only you know solid and liquid uh, like solid dissolved in a liquid or anything, there are two liquids which are um, mixed together and if they have two different boiling points you can do the same. The liquid with the lowest boiling point will boil first and collect it into the other one, the liquid with a high boiling point will remain in the um, initial flask. And one more technique called chromatography. And this technique separates substances on the basis of differences in solubility in a particular solvent. So here is um, a picture of how we do the chromatography. Um, if you put a dot of ink with different colors and immerse that in let us say an organic solvent like ethanol or something, um, there are different organic solvents you can use. Uh, through the capillary action, the, you can see the solvent is slowly going up on this paper, right? Can you see the difference? It is very light, but can you make it out? So the paper is getting wet slowly and uh, the capillary action, the solvent is going up. As the solvent goes up, see what happens. All colors in the ink do not have the same um, solubility. As we can see, the blue would dissolve first. So based on the order they dissolve, you can see they are getting separated. Whichever has the um, lowest solubility that will dissolve first and go up, then the next one, then the next one and so on. So this method is called chromatography. So those are the three common methods we use but there are other methods also uh, for separating mixtures. Um, now we will look into units of measurements also. Um, the units we would use in science is the SI unit, the metric system. 
uh, even though we use the English system very often in United States, um, in most of the other countries um, it's metric system and uh, in United States also for scientific work we use metric system. So people who are not familiar with the metric system, uh, you have to get a hold of that because that's what we are going to use here, okay. So these are the seven base units of the metric system, mass, length, time, temperature, amount of substance, electric current and luminous intensity. Now using the seven base units, you can derive other units also, say for example density. You can derive density from its definition, density is defined as what? The substance's mass divided by its volume. So if you have the mass and volume units, you can come out with a unit for density, right? So other um, units can be derived using this seven uh, base units. Um, and in metric system, 10 is the base unit for everything. Everything is based on base 10. And all these prefixes, you might have heard these prefixes in various um, places and what do they mean? Um, say for example, we have heard milli a lot, milliliter, millimeter, that's something very often you use. What do we mean by milli? Milli means 10 to the power negative 3 or something divided by 1000. Um, and as we go down further, micro 10 to the power negative 6, nano, we hear nanotubes, so nano means 10 to the power negative 9, pico 10 to the power negative 12 and so on. Again if you go up, we have kilo, kilogram, kilometer, kilo means 10 to the power 3 and then mega, giga, tera, peta, so on. So based on what type of problem you are working with, like that is if you are working with very small particles or very small units then probably you might be into nano or you know micro or milli and if you are working with larger units then probably you are in mega, giga, kilo, so on. So let us say volume. Usually we use volume in our day to day life, we use what? Gallon of milk, what else? Usually water, um, bottle of water is what? The regular bottle, I don't know. No, what is the name in uh, the English system? Ounces, okay. So you know, eight ounce or six ounce, things like that, right? But in chemistry and physics and in other sciences whenever you use volume we are not going to use those units but you are going to use um, the metric system unit and the most commonly used metric units are liters represented by a capital letter L and milliliter with a small case M and an L. Now this is how we, ca we can start with the lowest part like let us imagine a cube which has 1 centimeter length on one side. So a cube means it has all three sides the same length, right? So it is a 1 centimeter, 1 centimeter and 1 centimeter length, width and height. So when you take a cube like this, the volume, volume of a cube is calculated by LWH, length times width times height. So if you multiply those length times width times height, you get 1 centimeter cubed or 1 cubic centimeter. 1 cubic centimeter is exactly the same volume as in 1 milliliter, okay? So centimeter cubed and 1 milliliter, that ml can be interchanged. Now if you, so that is that one centimeter cube, let us imagine that is as the single dot which is shown here. Now if you take decimeters, what is decimeter means? 10 centimeters, okay. So if you take a cube of one decimeter of one side, so one decimeter cube, that would make up one liter. Now, how is 1 liter and 1 milliliter 
um, 1 liter and 1 milliliter connected, what is the conversion? 1 liter is how many milliliters? 1000 milliliters. Now here is a cube where you have 1 meter as one side, that is 1 meter side, 1 meter height, 1 meter length, 1 meter width. That is going to be a cubic meter. Okay, when we say cubic meter, you have heard that in when people talk about cubic feet, probably not cubic meter, but you have heard the expression cubic feet, right? That is a volume expression which in larger areas you use cubic feet. So, um, we use meter cube. So, this is uh, 1 meter cubed or a cubic meter. Now, another uh, measurement, temperature. Temperature is a measure of how hot or how cold a substance is. It is relative and it is a physical property of an object which shows the direction of the heat flow. Heat has this property of always flowing from a hot place to a cold place. If you have to reverse, then you have to do some work on it. Otherwise, heat normally will flow from hot to cold and temperature usually measures that which direction it goes and it is relative how cold or how, um, cold, how cold or how hot it is. Now, by definition, temperature means it is the average kinetic energy of particles in an object. So, everything is made of particles and the particles are always in motion even though we cannot see it with our naked eyes and kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So, if you at one time if you can take the average kinetic energy of all the particles in a sample that would give you the temperature that is the um, definition of temperature. Now, temperature we have various scales. Um, in scientific measurements, we use either Celsius scale or Kelvin scales. The Celsius scale is based on properties of water, that is freezing point and boiling point of water. Um, in Celsius scale, which is shown in the middle, 0 degree Celsius is the freezing point of water and 100 degree Celsius is the boiling point of water and the normal body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. This is the um, Celsius scale and that is what we will use mostly like in labs and all that when you do measurements of temperature you would use the Celsius scale. Calculations um, usually thermodynamics will use Kelvin scale, other calculations will use Celsius scale. So, both scales Kelvin and Celsius are used in calculations. Um, Kelvin scale is however the SI unit of temperature and that is based on the properties of gases and not that there are no negative temperatures on Kelvin scale. Um, if you look at the Kelvin scale, water will freeze at 273 Kelvin and water will boil at 373 Kelvin. The bo normal body temperature is 310 Kelvin. If you go further, not that in these two scales, if you go further, you get negative temperatures, right? We have heard of negative F temperatures and negative C temperatures. But in Kelvin, when you reach 0, that is the lowest possible temperature. We have not measured any temperature below this and this does not exist very, you know, often. You, this is kind of a theoretical point, the lowest possible temperature which is called absolute zero in Kelvin scale. You cannot have, you cannot go below that. That is why you do not have negative values in Kelvin scale. Now, the conversion between degree Celsius and Kelvin, you should all know that because these two scales are used and they are very often used in, um, you know, problems. Sometimes the equations use Kelvins, but the problem is given in degree Celsius. So, you have to do that conversion yourself. So, remember this, this is a conversion. It is very easy. The number is, you have to remember is 273.15. Roughly 273 is fine for calculations. You can leave that um, 0.15 part. So, 
whatever is the degree Celsius, add 273 to it, you get the Kelvin scale. So similarly, whatever is the Kelvin scale, subtract 273, you will get the degree Celsius. Okay? So that is how you convert between Kelvin and degree Celsius. Now Fahrenheit scale, even though we use it widely um, over United States, we do not use that in scientific measurements. But if you need conversions between Fahrenheit and uh, degree Celsius, here are the conversion factors. Fahrenheit is 9 over 5 multiplied by whatever is the degree Celsius plus 32. And if you are given temperatures in Fahrenheit and you want to convert that into degree Celsius, then 5 over 9 and minus 32. And of course, we know the scale. 32F is the freezing point of water, normal body temperature 98.6 and 212 is the boiling point of water. Now as I said, from the base units we can derive units for any quantity using the SI system. So density is the physical property of a substance which is defined as mass divided by volume. Therefore, it has the units grams per ml. We know that, well, let me try my pen. I haven't used that today. So, ooh, it's very small. Maybe I should try the felt tip pen which is a little more bigger. Uh, nah. Okay. So what is the unit of mass? SI unit of mass? Grams represented by G and volume is milliliters or 1 milliliter is centimeters cubed. Remember that. Again, in problems, it might be given as milliliters, but you may have to remember this in order to do the conversions. Okay? You would think, oh, this is given in milliliters. I don't have anything to convert into centimeters. What do I do? Remember that. One milliliter is one centimeter cube. So, that is why we have the units for density grams per ml or sometimes density is given as grams per centimeter cubed. Okay? So that is derived from its um, definition. Now we will look into uncertainty in measurements. So in scientific work, we often encounter numbers and there are two different kinds of numbers. One is called exact numbers, means we know the value of them exactly. Let's say, for example, one inch is 2.54 centimeters. That is, that 2.54 is an exact number because we know that for sure. Okay? Or um, something which you can count. Let's say, for example, I want to count the number of people in this classroom. That's an exact number once I count. Right? Whereas inexact numbers are numbers whose value have some kind of uncertainty. Say if I count the number of people in this class, I cannot say it's either 17 or 16. Right? I count it either it's 17 or 16 based on how many of you are present. I cannot say that it's either this or that. Um, so numbers whose values have some sort of uncertainty. They are called inexact numbers. And numbers we obtain by measurements are always inexact. When you measure something using an equipment, it is never an exact number. It always have some level of uncertainty in it, either from the equipment error or by the human error. Let's say, for example, you want to measure the mass of uh, something on an analytical balance. If the balance is not calibrated well enough, even if you did everything perfect, there is an uncertainty in your measurements, right? Because the balance was not calibrated. 
let's say the balance was good, but the way you read the numbers, a difference from, you know, person to person. As your book says, if I give you same, um, you know, amount of substance, and ask 10 of you to go and take the mass of it, you would all come up with 10 different numbers. They might be close together, but there will be some sort of uncertainty in it. So we would say every measurement has some sort of uncertainty in it, or those numbers are inexact. So again, different measuring devices have different uses and different degrees of accuracy. Say for example, here we have shown different equipments for measuring volume. The first one is called a graduated cylinder. So this one shows um, you can measure up to 100 ml and each of these lines that is 10 milliliters in between. Whereas a syringe, if you look at the lines, is that going to be 10 milliliters between two lines? No. The syringe, um, the total volume may be 1 milliliter or 2 milliliters. So you can imagine between these two lines there are very fine calibrations. Here is another um, device we use in a lot in the lab. You will do a lot of um, titrations. Uh, Burat, another device you use for measuring volume, which is calibrated to 0 to 50. So the calibration between these two lines is 1 milliliter versus 10 in the graduated cylinder. See the difference? Um, again, pipette, that's for very accurate um, measurements, as you can see how narrow that looks. And then volumetric flask, which has only one calibration right there on the neck. So different equipments, different glassware have different accuracy. So that brings us to the next question, what do we mean by accuracy? So two terms usually you will encounter when you do measurements in the lab, accuracy and precision. You want your measurements to be accurate and precise, okay, that is your goal. But we need to know what do we mean by accuracy and precision. Accuracy refers to the proximity of a measurement to the true value, how close you are to the accepted value. Whereas precision refers to the proximity of several measurements to each other. This picture clearly um, explains what it is. Let's say we have a dart board and putting all the darts in the center is our goal. Okay? To be accurate and precise, you have to have all the darts on the center. If you can do that, like in the first picture, all the darts in the center, you will say, I will say you have good accuracy and good precision because the, the true value or the accepted value is the center point. All your measurements are as close as uh, possible to the center point and your measurements agrees within each other. They are all close together. Now in the second one, all your dots are close together or they agree within each other. So they are precise but look at the accuracy. You are so far away from the true value or the true value we say the dot, the center dot, you are so far away from it. So your measurements are precise but not accurate. And look at the third guy, oh boy, all over the place, right? So the third one has poor accuracy and poor precision because they are not close to the true value which is the center point and the measurements within, I mean the dots they don't agree within each other. They are all over the place. So this is what we mean by precision and accuracy. And as I said, your goal is to have a measurement precise and accurate. Oh God, I can't see that red dot. You know what? We will stop right here. We will start the significant figures and the rules in next class. Questions so far? Everything is pretty basic. I would expect you guys all know this, but it's kind of a revision, you know, the terms which we forgot long time. All right. Thank you, guys. I will see you all guys on Thursday morning for the lab.